Easier transit through Hungary signals a new migrant influx through Europe. Ivory Coast bans potentially deadly skin whitening creams. And if you can't bear to be away from your dog, this Ibiza accommodation may be for you. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCorry. This is Africa 54. Thousands of refugees are crossing the border from Hungary into Austria Monday after the Hungarian government started relaxing restrictions. Aid workers and Austrian officials are expecting the influx to rise in the coming days as word filters back to others that the passage has become easier. VOA Europe correspondent Luis Ramirez reports from Vienna. A train loaded with refugees is met with applause as it arrives at the Austrian capital's Westbahnhof station. The welcome meant comfort for Abdul Malik Al Khaled, a medical student who escaped Syria and was stranded for days in Hungary, where he felt unwelcome. I don't want to complete my study. I want to stay here. But uh, Germany may be better than here to complete your study so that I will travel to there. But it's better here, in my opinion. Look, everybody, you are welcome in this country. Austrian volunteers offered tea and cigarettes. Across Europe, there are concerns about an influx that some say could change the face of the continent forever. For this volunteer offering candy, there are bigger concerns at the moment. I really don't know what the bigger picture is, but right now it's take care of the people, give them food, give them drink, give them shelter and let them pass through. Austrian authorities are making sure that passage is swift and efficient, transferring the refugees directly onto trains to Germany. In a waiting area, Abdul Malik and his cousins charge their phones. He has at least one cousin still waiting on the route in Macedonia. Once his phone is charged, he has some good news now that he is past Hungary and in Austria. I tell him when he arrives to here, he is better, better than any country. I tell you, yeah, I will tell him that. With the ordeal in Hungary now behind them, the road is smoother for the thousands who arrived in Vienna on their way to Germany, and for many more who are now encouraged to make the journey. Luis Ramirez. VOA News, Vienna. Well, as the path for refugees into Europe becomes easier, Germany Chancellor Angela Merkel announces a major financial commitment to integrate a large number of them into German society. The passage through Hungary is much smoother than it was last week when the Central European nation seemed ready to do whatever it could do to prevent the migrants from entering the wealthier Western European nations. Last week, a police tear gassed the migrants at Budapest's Kelleti station who wanted to go to Austria. Hungarians are now posting Austrian train schedules for the refugees. I stayed here this night. I came 12 o'clock yesterday and uh, there were very few people here then. And then maybe 100 arrived through the night, and, but most have left again. And now we just had like a new rush of people, but it's not very many, it's like 100 or something. Upon their arrival at Vienna's Westbahnhof train station, the refugees are met with applause from Austrians who efficiently guide the travelers from one train to another in their journey to Germany. Well, tired and uh, it's, uh, it's so, uh, so hard. Uh, four days in Hungary, uh, it's so difficult for us to reach uh, Austria. They were here uh, so nice people and uh, they do for us uh, and help us. Germany, Europe's wealthiest country, said Monday it is making an additional $6.6 .6 billion in public funds available next year to absorb the refugees into German society. Germany has said it is willing to accept 800,000 migrants. 
Wir werden auch in einer Taskforce Under Luxemburg EU Presidency, a task force will discuss the creation of refugee registration centers with the relevant countries leading up to the meeting of justice and interior ministers. That's urgent because let me also say that Germany is willing to take in refugees, but they can find shelter in every country of the European Union in a way which guarantees them protection from persecution and civil war. Many of the migrants already have relatives in Germany who are urging them to join their families there. The newly arrived refugees are communicating through their cell phones and their Facebook pages with relatives and friends who are further back in the immigration pipeline to inform them of what to expect on their journey to Europe. Austria, meanwhile, says it plans to eventually phase out emergency measures that have made it possible for the migrants to cross the border from Hungary. Well, there is growing speculation in Yemen that the Saudi-led coalition could be preparing the initial major, or rather to initiate a major um, change in its operation against the Iran-backed uh, Houthi rebels. A ground assault uh, might be in the works against the Houthis, who captured suites of the country earlier this year. A series of bomb attacks has also based, uh, uh, raised fears that the civil war is spiraling into a broader sectarian conflict. And Ridgewell reports. The self-styled Islamic State claimed responsibility for this double suicide bomb attack Wednesday on a Shiite mosque in Sana'a. 32 people were killed and dozens more wounded. It's a graphic illustration of Yemen's descent into chaos. The country's own civil conflict has also become a proxy battleground between regional powers vying for influence in a region unsettled both by the Arab Spring and by the Iranian nuclear deal. A coalition led by Saudi Arabia is carrying out airstrikes against the Houthi rebels, who Riyadh claims are backed by Iran. Human rights groups say thousands of civilians have been killed. Houthi supporters took to the streets of the capital last week in protest. We are in the streets today to denounce the Saudi attacks against our country. Forces loyal to the exiled president retook the southern port of Aden from the Houthis in July. A key security base in the city reopened Thursday. One of the major trends that has emerged in recent weeks is the growing influence of the UAE, which has played a key role in bolstering southern Yemeni fighters to push out the mostly northern Yemeni Houthi movement. Analysts say there is growing speculation in Yemen that the Saudi-led coalition will launch a ground operation to push the Houthis out of the capital. Speaking on a trip to Sudan, the exiled president, Abdu Rabu Mansour Hadi, claimed the Houthis were being rapidly pushed back and blamed Tehran for fueling the conflict. We are currently leading a war based on stopping Iranian expansion in the region. Iranian expansion is now present in Iraq, Syria, Lebanon. Iran denies it is providing military support and is unlikely to respond directly to any large ground operation by the Saudi-led coalition, says Jane Kinnamont. Yemen has never been a place of major strategic importance to Iran, so it's not like Iraq or Syria where those governments are incredibly close. Pro-government forces are now battling the Houthis and their supporters for control of Yemen's third city, Taiz, seen as the gateway to the rebel-held capital. Henry Ridgewell for VOA News, London. Well, the king of Saudi Arabia has wrapped up his visit to Washington following a meeting with U.S. President Barack Obama at the White House on Friday. King Salman expressed support for the Iran nuclear agreement negotiated by six world powers, uh, but that wasn't the only big topic discussed. Here's VOA's Caroline Prasuti. Demonstrating just how important this visit was, President Obama himself greeted King Salman at the West Wing before their meeting. The president, who is nearing political victory at home on the Iran nuclear deal, wanted to solidify Saudi support for the agreement. We'll discuss uh, the importance of effectively implementing uh, the deal. In return, the administration is offering new U.S. military aid and training. The New York Times says the $1 billion arms deal would provide weapons for the Saudis' fight in Yemen. 
Both leaders Friday agreed that U.N. Security Council resolutions are needed to reach a political solution there. Our uh, region uh, must uh, achieve uh, stability, which is essential for the prosperity of uh, its people and in our country. Since ascending the throne in January, King Salman has mounted an assertive foreign policy, bombing Iran-backed Houthi rebels in neighboring Yemen. Tom Lippman is with the Middle East Institute. The Saudis have now been at war in Yemen since March. They've used up a lot of ammo. They may have lost a couple of airplanes. And this is part of an ongoing military sales relationship. In fact, this is considerably smaller than the last arms deal that was approved. The Saudi foreign minister says King Salman expressed support for the Iran nuclear deal crafted by the P5 plus one nations that lift sanctions. But he warned of one thing. And we hope that uh, the Iranians will avail themselves of this opportunity in order to use the openness to the world and the additional income that they receive to uh, fund domestic development uh, rather than engage in nefarious activities in the region. But Lippmann says the Saudis will go home with what he calls a conundrum. They want to put a stop to the violence and to uh, head off Iranian ambitions, but they don't want, they also want to confront the Islamic State and they don't want to do it in cooperation with the Iranian-sponsored militias. Any U.S. arms deal previewed at the meeting would need congressional approval. At the White House, Carolyn Prasuti, VOA News. U.S. lawmakers returned to work in Washington this week after a month-long recess. Recent days have seen a flurry of uh, senators announce their positions on the International Nuclear Accord with Iran. Viewers Michael Bowman reports the pact has more than enough support to survive, but still lacks the backing required to prevent Congress from passing an initial uh, resolution of disapproval. Frankly, this is not the agreement that I had hoped for. I also have a number of serious concerns based on Iran's past behavior of cheating on nuclear agreements. Like many Democrats, Senator Chris Coons is not wildly enthusiastic about the Iran nuclear deal. But like most Democrats, he supports it anyway. We cannot trust Iran. But this deal, based on distrust, verification, deterrence, and strong principled multilateral diplomacy, offers us what is today our best remaining opportunity to prevent Iran from developing a nuclear weapon. In recent days, five other Democratic senators issued similar statements of support despite misgivings. Cory Booker said, quote, it is better to support a deeply flawed deal for the alternative is far worse. Mark Warner said, quote, while I choose to support the deal, I am not satisfied with it. Until Friday, only one Democrat, Chuck Schumer, had announced opposition. Since then, he has been joined by Senators Ben Cardin and Robert Menendez. We know that despite the fact that Iran claims their nuclear program is for peaceful purposes, that they have violated the international will, as expressed by various UN Security Council resolutions, and by deceit, deception, and delay, advance their program to the point of being a threshold nuclear state. Given unified Republican opposition to the accord, all eyes are on the remaining handful of Democratic senators yet to announce. Already there is ample backing to sustain President Barack Obama's promised veto of a resolution of disapproval from Congress. The undecided senators will determine whether Senate action can be blocked altogether. If that happens, then uh, the a uh, resolution of disapproval won't reach the president's desk and there'll be no need to exercise the veto. Uh, that's, that's a tough goal, uh, but uh, it is a possible one. An initial vote in the House of Representatives could come by week's end. Michael Bowman, VOA News, Washington. We want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. Check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCor. Let me hear from you. And well, coming up, another sub-Saharan country bans skin lightning products. Stay with us.
do you see the world? I see countries in turmoil. I see our planet changing. I see people at peace. No matter how you see the world, you'll get an unbiased and uncensored view of it on Voice of America, on television, radio, online, and mobile. In more than 40 languages all day, every day, millions of people tune us in. How do I see the world? On Voice of America. Welcome back. Ivory Coast is ranked among the top five African countries in skin lightening product use and purchase. Now the government has decided to place a ban on the health hazardous products. Africa 54's Mel Bailey has our report. Ivory Coast is the most recent sub-Saharan country to ban the products used in skin lightening, a phenomenon which is most present in Asia and on the continent of Africa. Among its users, the process of skin lightening is thought up in the same vein as coloring one's hair. However, medical scientists have recognized that the effects of some skin lightening products can be fatal. This year we signed the decree that outlawed the commercialization of all skin lightening cosmetics and moreover similar products that contain illegal substances. Most skin lightening creams contain an agent called hydroconine. Hydroconine is classified as a poison and has been listed on chemical databases as a possible carcinogen, severe skin irritant, and allergen. Users of the products insist that despite some key ingredients being the same, some local products are worse than others. When you're in the market and people are selling, you just buy whatever, and you don't know what pomade will work best for you. But sometimes when you don't take the good products, it gives you scars and marks and wrinkles. It gives you blemishes. Some don't know that it's the pomade that's doing it, but your skin is scarred. So you have to use the good pomade. Skin lightening products come in many different forms and varieties. There are creams, soaps, pomades, body milks, butters, and oils, many of which are pricey, especially the imported ones, Felicity Amason explains. Local products are less expensive than the imported products. The more expensive products are regarded as the best. Women have described having a hot feeling when applying local products to their body and then seeing scars and marks afterward. But even with the twice daily application ritual, the desired visible effects are not permanent. But the side effects often are. We use them and it destroys our pigmentation. It destroys our skin. We become even uglier than we were before. The law that they passed is good. It obliges us to seek safer products in the supermarkets or in the pharmacy to buy the imported products, the good ones. Although the new law was passed earlier this summer, products are still being sold in some local markets and pharmacies. But the pharmaceutical and medical board says they're working with other ministries to enforce the ban and remove all skin lightening products from the country. Mel Bailey for Africa 54, Avijan. Ivory Coast. Well, the host of viewers, Africa News Tonight radio broadcast, Yehiz Wohib, recently talked to Noah Samara, the chairman and CEO of Yasmi USA Incorporated and former chief executive officer of World Space. In many circles, Mr. Samara is addressed as the founding father of satellite radio. In 1995, your company, World Space, selected Alcatel in Toulouse, France, as prime contractor to deliver the World Space system under a turnkey contract. This system, it turns out, would be the first digital worldwide broadcasting system to use direct satellite transmission. At the time, it was nothing less than a revolution a revolution for Africa, the Middle East, Asia, and Latin America, a revolution in the airwaves. Indeed, a bold and innovative undertaking. How did you first come up with the idea, a young person, just fresh out of college, working at a law firm, and from there to come up with an idea to finance and transport satellites into space? simply remarkable. Take us back to the early days 
where the idea of world space and average space started to germinate. So first I should say uh, it happened in large part because I was too young to know better. Uh, over time, I realized that the difference in progress in between Africa and, uh, and Europe or Africa and the United States was really nothing other than the lack of information in one and the abundance of information in the other. Mm -hmm. And so the, the critical question became, how does one create information affluence across this large continent of Africa or for that matter even in large parts of Asia? And that's how the idea of world space initially and now Yasmi uh, w was born was really to create information affluence everywhere where there was dearth of information. You have been quoted as saying that African countries are at the bottom uh, of the ranking as far as education is concerned. To put it bluntly, you say the facts that define education in Africa are not good. So what, in your opinion, are the key factors that can enrich Africa's future so in terms in of the, these facts, uh, first, we state them because if you want to correct a problem, the first place to start is to acknowledge the problem, the magnitude of the problem, so that you can create solutions around that magnitude rather than coming up with solutions that fall short of what needs to be done. The, there are four factors, I would say, that are really important. In, in solving the problem of, uh, of education. One is the first and most important thing that governments need to do if they want to see change in education is to make large commitments, bold, large commitments in the field of education because that is the critical building block, the most important infrastructure of all infrastructures. It is the infrastructure at the mind level of your, uh, your population. You're building the infrastructure, the mind infrastructure of your people. So investing in education and investing boldly in education, not three, four, five percent of GDP, uh, but much larger amounts of GDP to really affect and effect change is the most important thing that can happen. Well, that was Fiores Iheyes, who he was speaking with, Noah, Noah Samara, CEO of Yasmi USA Incorporated. Tomorrow, in part two of our feature on Mr. Samara, he talks about his latest venture, the Yasmi Project. Well, it's time now for a short break. Still to come on Africa 54, the ultimate in luxury for spoiled pooches. We'll be right back. Who is the moderator? Malnutrition continues to be pervasive and the situation is currently getting worse. <laughs> Welcome back to Africa 54. Here's what's trending. Do you love your dog? If so, how much? Welcome to Ibiza, where everyone is welcome, including pampered pooches. Uh, Melia uh, Ibiza is one of 50 
pet-friendly hotels on the island. Here, canines are treated as VIP guests, even able to order a meal from a special menu. The 50 euro daily fee for pets includes a welcome basket with furry toys, dog candies, and bottled mineral water. According to a survey on the, uh, on the website, Home away, 32% of tourists from the UK, Spain, Germany and Italy will choose their holiday destination according to their pet's needs. Well, next up, Queen Bay celebrates her birthday and serves up an em empowerment message at a Philadelphia concert. Beyonce, who turned 34 on Friday, headlined the first night of her husband's two-day music festival in, in Philadelphia. The diva reached back into the Destiny's Child catalog and performed some of the group's biggest hits, including Say My Name, uh, Jumping, Jumping, and Independent Woman Part One. Uh, the queen of pop, uh, Beyonce, offered words of encouragement and empowerment to the crowd of screaming, of screaming fans. Well, and finally, new ways to capture the world on video. Check out uh, the uh, Panano camera ball. The ball consists of 36 cameras, each with a 3 uh, megapixel resolution. When you throw the ball up in the air, uh, the cameras automatically take a photo when the ball reaches its highest point. If you're looking for a different way to capture all angles of an image, you could try a handheld 3D scanner instead. The 3D scanner from XYZ Printing creates a three-dimensional picture of anything, including a person's face. Pretty cool, and that is what is trending today. Well, it's time now for Monday Sports Report. For the latest on all Africa games, we turn to Sunny Young with the sunny side, side of sports. Hello, Sunny. Hello, Vincent, and sporty greetings once again to our Africa 54 viewers. The 2015 All Africa Games have begun in Congo, Brazzaville, where the multi sports competition was first held. 50 years ago. There's competition in more than 20 sports, including tennis, athletics, boxing, karate, badminton, weightlifting, cycling, and swimming. Egypt and South Africa have dominated the medals table at recent All-Africa Games. And after the opening weekend of action, those two countries were once again at the top more than 50 African countries are represented in Congo Brazzaville. The main venue is the new Kintele Stadium in Brazzaville, which officially opened last month. I'm VOA Sonny Young, and that's the sunny side of sports. Vincent? Well, thanks a lot, son. Now, be sure to watch the sunny side of sports every Monday and Friday right here on Africa 54. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. For more news, tune in to VOA's evening radio show, Africa News Tonight at 1800 UTC. And in the mornings, today, break Africa between 0300 and 0600 UTC, Monday through Friday. Thanks a lot for watching. From all of us here in Washington, have a good night. Good stuff. Welcome to English in a Minute. This American idiom is about getting your facts right. Did you hear that rumor going around about Craig and Cheryl calling off their wedding? Yeah, I heard it straight from the horse's mouth. Craig told me he's calling off the wedding. I didn't want to ask too many questions, but it's true. Do people really look into a horse's mouth for facts? Straight from the horse's mouth means you got information about a situation directly from a person involved, and not through rumors. The saying comes from the fact that people can tell the true age of a horse by looking at the teeth in its mouth. So if you get your information straight from the horse's mouth, you have the truth. 
and that's English in a Minute.